the, despite the fact that the opioids have all these negative effects, that uh, people still do it. Um, it uh, makes you feel numb. Of course, the reason that they're, they're using opioids is because of the euphoric effect that they get. They're not doing it for the dry mouth. They're not going, you know, uh, I've been pooping too much. I think, I think I need to be a little bit more constipated. So they, they take the opioids. And the reason the opioids stop you from, uh, from uh, stop your, your uh, digestive system is because it stops your digestive system. So it just slows everything way, way down. So constipation is a really serious problem for people who use who are heroin addicts or uh, use too many opioids. Uh, decreases your pulse, of course, it, it slows everything down. Uh, it lowers your blood pressure, which is a good thing if you have high blood pressure. Uh, your, your breathing um, is shallow to the point that it stops. And this can be a really serious problem. Uh, this uh, can be a really serious problem. The other problem is that uh, no matter what happens in your in your lungs and in your mouth, you can't cough. It's, it keeps you from coughing, as strange as that sounds. Uh, if you came into the emergency room and we thought that maybe you had a uh, uh, you had overdosed on overdose on heroin, the first thing we'd look at is your pupils to find out if you had pinpoint pupils. It's the weirdest thing in the world. It's like they have no pupils at all if somebody has overdosed on, on heroin or any of the opiates. And the other thing is uh, you just don't feel like doing anything. It's really kind of weird. So these are the effects that people have uh, when they uh, have overdosed or when they're using uh, heroin. Now you can see that most of these are fairly negative except for the euphoria. And it's the euphoria, of course, that keeps the individual coming back to uh, use again. Now, when they stop using heroin, everything reverses itself. Uh, uh, that's the new, uh, whereas before, a lot of pain. Yeah. A lot of pain. Well, my cousin, I told you he overdosed, but he stopped. He was clean for two months. And yeah. Had, I can't it. yeah, so they're numb. I mean, they're literally numb. They can't feel a thing. Uh, as soon as uh, they, uh, they go off the heroin, uh, they start having tactile reactions. They feel pain in all their joints and all their skin. It's the most bizarre thing in the world. Of is course, they... Real, I'm sorry? Is that like real pain for them, or is it just like... like they feel it's it. in their mind. They're they feeling it. Or what? <laughs> no, you're right. It's, it's in their minds. Um, so... Yeah, but it's, I mean, whether you, if you feel pain, you feel pain. But my cousin said it feels like someone is like reaching his insides and twisting them and stretching at the same time. Right. That's what he said. Yeah. Okay. But the reality is nothing like yeah. that's happening. That's not what's happening. He just feel, really? feels like that's what's happening. Uh, of course, you um, crave the uh, drug, but you also feel anxious and you feel depressed. So you're, you've got psychological reactions as well. Physical excretory reactions, you, every, uh, whereas before you had no fluid coming out of you at all, you couldn't poop, you, could, you didn't really pee, <clears throat> all of a sudden uh, you've got water running out of every, every orifice in your body. Your nose is running, you're sweating, uh, your, your eye, you can't stop crying. Um, you, uh, you, you're, you keep salivating, it's just liquid comes off, out of <clears throat> everywhere in your body. Whereas before, when you were on the heroin, when you are on the opioid, uh, of course you were all, you had dry mouth, you, 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 know, you couldn't cry, you couldn't cough. Now all of a sudden, you're coughing like crazy and you've got water running from every orifice of your body. It's coming out of your anus. Uh, it's just that you're sweating like a pig uh, and it stinks. Oh my god, it stinks because they're afraid. It is, it, and they have the odor of fear about them. Uh, of course, uh, not only do they, are they, do they have water coming out of all of their orified, but they also have uh, diarrhea because remember they were constipated before. Now this gets to be really interesting because if they've been using for a while, then they've got a almost a blockage in their gut. So this stuff backs up 
and they'll have explosive diarrhea. It's just the most not unpleasant thing you could possibly imagine. So they've got this blockage and all of a sudden this chunk of, of feces comes out and then there's, after that it's just water. Uh, circulatory reaction, they, before they had low blood pressure, now they have hypertension. Uh, like I said before, uh, you can't cough when you're uh, using uh, opioids. You cannot cough no matter what. It, what is stuck in your throat, you can't cough it out. Uh, of course, now they can't stop coughing. And they get a red, raw throat. Uh, they're, uh, <laughs> whereas before they had pinpoint pupils and they couldn't see anything, now all of a sudden their pupils are dilated. And it's like every, they're taking in everything. And of course, everything scares the crap out of them. Muscular reactions, severe hyper, uh, reflexes, and muscle cramps. Uh, a lot of this has to do with the fluid that they're losing. But as you can see, it's no fun. <clears throat> now, people, that, people think that heroin uh, withdrawals are the worst. But the reality <coughs> is they're about the same as everything else. People very, very rarely die. Of, uh, of heroin withdrawals <clears throat> or opioid withdrawals, very rarely. But the reason that pe you, people don't want to, uh, uh, to go off of heroin or the opioid is because of the euphoria. They miss the euphoria. It's the craving that yeah, keeps them using the drug. Now, they're using the drug for a reason. Uh, let's say you've got a, a, somebody who's a, a guitar player in a rock band. Uh, why in the world does he use heroin? Why should he use heroin? Well, the answer is because he feels like he doesn't, he, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's, he's got a low self-esteem. Uh, you know, it's like sex, drug, drugs, and rock and roll. Why in the world uh, is, is he able to do this? The answer is because he, he doesn't think that he can. And that's why he's using, because he feels like he's a faker. So he uses the heroin, then it makes him feel good. Uh, it, it, uh, and that's why he continues to use. So once, uh, once he, he gets on this stuff, uh, of course, uh, it's really hard for him to come off because he's using it psychologically. He's using it to, to dissipate his feeling of inadequacy as weird as that may seem. And that's one of the reasons why so many of the Rock and roll artists use heroin uh, because it makes them feel good. They get on stage and of course they, they feel like they're, you know, a million bucks. Uh, when they come off, they feel like they're inadequate. And that's when they start using heroin. Uh, drug withdrawal is the body's attempt to rebalance itself after cessation of prolonged use of psychoactive substances. Many times for a chronic user, fear of withdrawal is one of the reasons for continued use. Uh, they are afraid of it. Uh, the most uh, destructive withdrawal symptoms are the withdrawal symptoms for alcohol. Uh, people die. They go into seizures. And they die. Uh, many times a chronic user fear of withdrawal is one of the reasons for continued use. Uh, withdrawal often entails uh, muscle aches, pain, insomnia, vomiting, cramps, and on occasion convulsions, but especially with alcohol withdrawals. Not so much with uh, opioid withdrawals. It's, they're not nearly as severe. Uh, opioid withdrawals are like having the flu. That's what it feels like. People very rarely die of opioid uh, uh, withdrawals. <clears throat> but there's a relatively large percentage of people who go through alcohol withdrawals who die, sadly. <clears throat> Uh, lots of different types of withdrawals, uh, non-purposive withdrawals, visible uh, physical signs uh, due to tissue dependence. Uh, the individual goes into seizures. U usually this is alcohol, of course. Uh, seizures, sweating, loose bumps, vomiting, diarrhea, and tremors uh, last for three or four days. And then they're okay. Usually they have detoxified. The, they have... They have burped the stuff out of their system and now they're ready to, uh, to recover. Um, heroin, it takes about a week for you to, to come to detoxify. What's, uh, what's methadone? Methadone? Yeah. 
Uh, now, you've got to remember that the reason that, that people continue to use isn't because, well, it's the fear of withdrawals, for one thing, but it's the lack of the euphoria. So methadone gives you a feeling of, of uh, euphoria, but it's less addictive than heroin is. So that's the methadone treatment. You still get the methadone high, uh, but uh, it's not nearly as addictive. So they, it's a replacement drug. So they use it as a replacement drug. It's less destructive than heroin. It's no neighborhood it was like two were near in the bed. Yeah, so a lot of people use it. See, lined up at like 6 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> well, of course. <laughs> they're starting to have withdrawals, so of course they're going to line up to get their <clears throat> shot of method, methadone. Well, I guess it's in a pill. So is heroin worse than meth? I'm sorry? Is heroin worse than meth? Uh, meth, meth, it, meth is more highs, than, two different highs. From yeah, yeah, one's a high and the other's kind of a, a low, dude, but you feel so good. Okay, and, but meth, uh, meth is, uh, is your real excited, it's like speed. Okay, and that was like a little bit more than heroin, is it? You mean it's more addictive? Like. That and like price-wise, is it? Oh, I don't know about the price. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, it, it. Well, I guess I can answer this one. It, 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 it all depends, okay. you know, because it all depends on the cut and then whether or not you get a good deal and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but age would probably be more expensive. Like, I would think so. Uh, meth is real easy to cook. Uh, heroin, you gotta. You, get, you need opium poppies, unless it's, it's synthetic. Purpose of withdrawal, expectation of withdrawal symptoms causing the uh, rationalization of continued use of the psychoactive substance. Withdrawal effects can be observed whether there is tissue dependence or not. Uh, so this is one that uh, uh, marijuana, of course, is purpose of withdrawal. Uh, protracted withdrawal, heavy craving for the drug, even after the addict has been detoxified. This is uh, usually caused from an external cue that causes the subject to have flashbacks to use it and uh, withdrawal symptoms. Remember, there's lots, there's lots of different reasons why individuals use. Uh, they use with their friends. Uh, they uh, use in special places. <coughs> if they don't leave that, that area, if they, then the lifestyle will continue. And if they're around the same people that they used with before, now every time they see these people, they'll get a craving to use. So the best thing for people to do it, after they get off of the drug is, is to remove themselves from that area, like you know, your neighborhood, where they have the two methadone treatment centers, lots of people using drugs, you see the needles, you, you see the people sniffing, that means they're going through withdrawals because when you're on heroin, you don't, you, you, fluid does not come out of your body, but once, once you start going through withdrawals, they, you know, they have a run, the whole runny nose, their eyes are all yeah, red and teary. It was this guy who would always, because we'd always go to the Jack in the Box, like after school, right? Uh -huh. You know, me and friends over there. Sure. There was this guy who would always come and he just, I mean, just, his hands look like someone poured water on them. Yeah. It's not coming up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, my friend, Eduardo, he was. He's coming down, man. Yeah, he's coming down. Dang. Exactly <clears> true. <throat> That's exactly what was going on. This often causes a recovering addict to relapse, of course, when they get near uh, their cues. And everybody has, has their own cues, of course. It may be a person. It may be a place. Uh, it may be smells. Um, oh, well, we won't go into that. Uh, yeah, but odors uh, can do it as well. Um, <clears throat> Okay, uh, sometimes it has to do with, di the, remember the diarrhea I was talking about? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, diarrhea has a, has a specific odor to it. Uh, I knew guys that uh, when they smelled, you know, feces, they, it made them want to use because that was withdrawal as far as they were concerned because they always went, they always got the squirts when they, when they were going through withdrawal. I've seen people when I used to go home. They have to go to the bathroom, like right before, right. Like they, I guess they knew it was coming. Exactly. And it's just, yeah. No, I'll be on a minute. Exactly. 
<laughs> well, why is that? What is it? Well, it has to do. It has to with the to do with their withdrawal symptoms. Yeah, it's, it has to do with excitement. It has to. Do, it's a trigger. It's a trigger. Uh, my wife, every time she drinks coffee, she has a bowel movement. I mean, what's what's that all about? Uh, what's it that? Diuretic. Well, yeah, diuretic makes you pee. It doesn't make you take a uh, dump. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's the it's the warm liquid <clears throat> in her stomach that makes her need to have a, a bowel movement. As weird as that is. Yes, I mean, so it's a trigger. You know, every time it's. Five, eight o'clock, or it's 10 o'clock in the morning, she, she had a cup of coffee at 8 o'clock, now it's time to, to go to the restroom, you know, it's that kind of a situation. <clears throat> but uh, with these guys, they, of course, they're constipated when they're using, so when they're going through withdrawals, then they have diarrhea. If they smell the diarrhea, it reminds them of the withdrawals. And this gets really weird because, I mean, all they have to do is go past a sewer, and of course it smells... You can, it smells like feces. So these, that's a cue for these individuals, as strange and odd as that is. And, and I know nobody talks about smells, but the reality is smell, smells can trigger things. I hope you didn't spill. No worries. Okay. Okay. Post-acute withdrawal symptoms, persistent emotional and physical problems that last uh, from three to six months after recovery, unclear thinking and cognitive impairment, uh, memory problems, emotional overreaction, uh, sleep disturbances, motor coordination, dizziness problems, difficulty managing stress, and cra of course craving the drug. Uh, we've talked about meth. Uh, when you have, uh, when you're a meth head, uh, that means that you're not real bright and for about 18 months after, after you stop using crystal meth. Crystal meth restructures your brain. And the intelligence level that you had before you started using meth, you will not return to that for about 18 months. 18 months. For 18 months, you're going to be not as smart as you were before. And this is known as meth head. And of course, you have all these uh, overreactions to what's going on. You're easily irritated. Uh, you can't manage stress. It just makes you... What if like, you've been doing it for so long? Like, what, meth? Yeah. Well, like, or is there like no chance of getting back to? Well, no chance. Uh, no, it, it lasts for about 18 months. I mean, it restructures your brain. So your brain has to restructure itself, and it takes about 18 months for that to happen. With other drugs like alcohol or heroin, it, it's, it, uh, you, you're stupid for, for only you know, three to six months. Uh, but with meth, it's, it's prolonged because it, it so restructures your brain. So your brain has to restructure itself, has to go back and, and balance itself. Remember, your brain always wants to be normal. It doesn't want to be depressed. It doesn't want to be anxious. It wants to be normal. So it will do whatever it, ha it takes uh, for, for that to happen. Sometimes drug abuse is the symptom of other, uh, of other underlying problems. When this is the case, the user sometimes seeks the desired effect by experimenting with drug usage. Uh, replacement, uh, they'll use a replacement drug. Uh, one of the things I noticed on the Fort Belknap Reservation, uh, there were a lot of recovered and recovering alcoholics, um, these or drug addicts, uh, they always replaced it with something else. Uh, some of them replaced it with sugar and then they developed diabetes. I had a friend that uh, uh, you couldn't give him any money, you know, if so. <laughs> If you were doing something and he was supposed to hold the money for, you know, for the, the powwow or whatever, uh, you, you never could give him money because if he had money in his pocket, he would go and, and he would gamble it until it was all gone. Uh, his idea, of course, and he said this over and over again, I was trying to double your money. I was trying to triple your money. Oh, come on. You're just, you know, he was gambling and, and he had been a really bad alcoholic for, for for 17 years, uh, but now he was a recovered alcoholic. He just traded one in for But he one. traded one for the other, his gambling addiction. So uh, you couldn't put any money in the guy's pocket. I mean, sometimes he would gamble away all of his money and he wouldn't have any money to eat. So, you know, people would feed him. Uh, he was a nice guy. I mean, everybody just loved the guy, but the <clears> problem <throat> was you just couldn't give him any money. Uh, if, and, and he would always want to take it. You know, he would always want to keep it. 
here, I'll, I'll keep it. I've, I've got a safe place at my house, you know, that kind of thing. He'd always want to be the one to take the money, but the reality was he couldn't be uh, trusted with money. So uh, he was using the gambling as a replacement for the, uh, the intoxicant. In his case, it was alcohol. Multiple drug use, so they will use use of different drugs to alleviate differing uh, symptoms. Uh, so these people will become hypochondriacs. Uh, so whereas before uh, they were using alcohol for their depression, uh, now of course they're, they're using SSRIs and of course they're, they're using these mega doses of SSRIs trying to alleviate their depression. Before of course it was easy, all they did was you know go out and get drunk, it changed their serotonin level, or it changed their GABA level, and now all of a sudden, of course, you know, just after, after a, a bottle of whiskey, everything is good to go. But uh, now they needed all these SSRIs. Uh, cycling is using a drug uh, intensely for a period of time and then abstaining to lower tolerance or allow the body to repair. This is what Amy Winehouse used to do. Uh, she had developed a tolerance for alcohol, so she could drink a lot of alcohol without any, without any effect, and she didn't like that. So what she would do, uh, she would, uh, she she was a binge drinker. Uh, so what she would do, she would go off alcohol for two or three weeks, or maybe a month, uh, and then the next time she she drank uh, whatever she was drinking she'd get really, really drunk. And that's what she was after. She was after that, uh, uh, that euphoria. Well, unfortunately, of course, the last time she drank, she drank vodka, and she drank excess, uh, excessive amounts of it, and she died with a very large uh, percentage of alcohol in her system. It killed her. And the reason was because she was trying to cycle. She was, uh, she was coming off the stuff to lower her, her tolerance level. Uh, so that she would have a more uh, extreme reaction. <laughs> Every time we come back from deployment, they'll be like, don't drink like you used to. Okay? Exactly. Nine times out of ten, you would have at least three or four, mostly eight fours and below. Yeah. Friggin' just blitzed. <laughs> After like, I don't know, that shot and like three beers. It's like, what the heck, man? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I've seen that a lot. People coming back from, well, of course, in Vietnam, you could drink all you wanted. But uh, not Iraq and Afghanistan. They're supposed to be Muslim countries, and you're supposed to control your, your alcohol intake. I know people would send you alcohol in. No, coming back. Yeah, I know, I know. Yeah. But they'd send you a bottle of mouthwash, and it was really, you know, vodka or something. Well, I, I was pretty good with my school. I would, I'm all, I guess you guys packages. One guy tried to, and I like, nope. <laughs> it happened. <laughs> but it's mostly the guys who, like, really don't go outside the wire, like right. the mechanics, the cooks. Man, I heard the cooks would get blitzed out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there was <laughs> Exactly. <coughs> Stacking is using two or more similar drugs at the same time to achieve a specific effect. Uh, mixing is using drug combinations uh, to acquire a new effect. Uh, this is where speed balls came from. Uh, who the hell would think of mixing heroin and cocaine together? Uh, they do opposite things, uh, but uh, of course if you speed ball, uh, you're putting a lot of uh, toxins in your system. Uh, that's what John Belushi died of uh, speed balling. So did Chris Farley died of speed balling. Uh, it's a really dangerous combination. Uh, marijuana laced with cocaine, of course, that's uh, marijuana laced with uh, opium was uh, Thai sticks in, in uh, Vietnam. Uh, but uh, of course you can put just about anything in, on marijuana. Uh, individuals used, to, or, or they do today, they put PCP, sprinkle PCP mm -hmm. on their marijuana. That sounds really stupid, but I mean they'll do just about anything. Uh, ecstasy and LSD, both of these uh, have to do with serotonin, uh, and they call it XNL, ecstasy and LSD, and it's supposed to be a really good high. We're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about LSD and uh, uh, rat poison. If you take LSD with rat poison, it gets into your system faster. It takes LSD about an hour to get into your system. So when you drop acid. <clears throat> 
it's it's not an immediate effect. You have to sit there and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, and then about an hour later things start happening. Uh, so what people were trying to accelerate it into their system, and so they were mixing it with rat poison, and they called it window pane, and because you went crashing through the window. Uh, the problem was, of course, uh, there were some negative reactions. If you got too much rat poison, it killed you. Uh, I was uh, teaching high school in uh, Indiana. Just before I entered the service, I was substitute teaching, and uh, two girls dropped window pane, and they, I was, it was a phys ed class, and they started running around the track, and one of them didn't make it. She collapsed and started convulsing. Uh, she died. Uh, there was, we couldn't bring her back, but the other, one, the other one didn't. I guess she took less rat poison. I don't know. Anyway, the, the girl poisoned herself to death. So, window pane. If you get too much rat poison, you're in trouble. <laughs> anyway, she, anyway, she died. Yeah, is, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really kind of interesting. <clears throat> methadone and clonopin is it mimics heroin. Uh, of course, methadone is not nearly as powerful or strong as heroin is. But if you take it with clonopin, it feels about the same. Sequentialing is going from one addiction to the other. Uh, this can either refer to drug sequentialing, drug replaced by a compulsive behavior, or one compulsive behavior <coughs> replacing another. Of course, this is the problem. This is the problem with obsessive compulsive uh, individuals. You never want to get obsessive compulsive people together because they will borrow each other's compulsions. Now, all of a sudden, where, whereas they had one compulsion, now they have two or three. As far as that goes, morphing. Uh, using one drug to counter uh, act another, a uh, cocaine user may drink alcohol to come down uh, because, of course, alcohol is a depressant, cocaine is a stimulant. Uh, using coffee to come down off of a drunk, uh, this happens a lot. Uh, alcohol, of course, is a, is a depressant and uh, coffee is a stimulant because of the caffeine. Uh, using methamphetamine to uh, function during a heroin high. <laughs> I know. <laughs> this is nuts. I mean, people, people if you do a drug to function, you need to quit. I, well, yeah, of course, but of course you can't convince them of that. The level of use is determined by the amount that you use, um, how often you use it, the length of time psychoactive substances have been used, and the impact the drug usage has on the user's life. <clears throat> that has to do with uh, the level of use. Categories of usage include abstinence, uh, experimentation, social recreational use, ha habituation, uh, abuse, and addiction. Many individuals cannot choose their level of drug use but are at the mercy of the psychoactive properties of the drug being used. Can they get the drug frequently enough to uh, be an addict or to, for this to be a habit? Uh, of course, these, these are all things that we talk about when we're talking about marijuana. Uh, abstinence uh, means that the individual does not use any psychoactive substances except accidentally, uh, even if the person has a strong hereditary or environmental susceptibility for compulsive drug use. By never starting, they never get hooked. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a logical thing to do, is that if you never use, then you're never going to to get hooked just because everybody else in your family is, is an alcoholic doesn't mean that you have to be an alcoholic. Uh, if you never start drinking, you're not an alcoholic. Uh, these individuals might display other compulsive behaviors, gambling, overeating, uh, compulsive internet use, excessive sexual behavior. You know, these are all uh, things that, uh, if they have an addictive personality. I have a nephew, great, great nephew, Yes, he's my great great nephew. Uh, he was addicted to heroin when he was born. As sad as that is, <clears throat> and because of that, it took him six weeks to detoxify, uh, which is a long. They almost lost him a couple times, but he's okay. Uh, but uh, his bit, the biggest problem is that uh, he has an addictive personality. I mean, he was born with addicted to heroin, so uh, that. Uh, Connection has already been made in his brain. Uh, so I told my brother that he needed to be careful. Uh, his 
my brother is his great grandfather. Uh, I told him he needed to be careful because uh, this individual is susceptible to any kind of addiction. Uh, so they needed to make sure that uh, that he didn't uh, maintain any compulsive behaviors. Otherwise, it will become an addiction for this kid. Research shows that individuals who wait until they are 18 or older experiment with alcohol to experiment with alcohol, nicotine, or marijuana are less likely to use these substances as gateway drugs for more dangerous substances such as cocaine or heroin. So if you don't use, if you don't drink, if you don't smoke, if you don't uh, use any type of uh, psychoactive substance before the age of 18, the probability of you becoming an addict is very, very, is relatively low. So what they need to do, what people need to do is not use until, if they're, if they're going to drink, not to drink until they're 21 years old. This year in Germany, <laughs> is it 16? Um, 15? Yeah, it's 16. The legal drinking age in Germany is 16. Different, different, uh, different culture. Totally different culture. We're talking about the United States. However, if the individual experiments between the ages of 10 and 12, they're more likely to use the early experiment <coughs> as a gateway to more serious usage. Individuals who don't start smoking until the age of 21 are very unlikely to develop an addiction to nicotine. <clears throat> you don't develop a taste for it. That portion of your brain has not, uh, has not developed an addiction. Anyone who doesn't try an addictive substance until age 21 will probably not become an addict. And of course, if we can keep people from doing that. So I know we'll make it illegal for them to use marijuana or alcohol or tobacco until they're 21 years up until, until they're 21 years old. We just solved the problem. We just made it a law. That always works. All you have to do is tell people not to do it and they don't. Mm -hmm. I know. Those little those kids, they won't smoke cigarettes if you tell them they can't. If you make it illegal for them to smoke, wait a minute, they smoke anyway. Mm -hmm. They drink anyway. They smoke pot anyway. <clears throat> so how in the world are we going to control this stuff? We can make it illegal. That almost kind of just about works. But if we legalize it, what's going to happen next? If we legalize marijuana, how are we going to keep the kids from using it? If they're using it now, but if they're going to use it at a higher level, if we legalize it. Well, at least we're making money off the kids, and that's all that's important. Experimentation uh, with the psychoactive substance, uh, substances occurs because of curiosity, but no pattern of usage is uh, developed, and there are no negative consequences from the experimentation unless uh, usage leads to injury, uh, accident, or illness. The individual has an exagger exaggerated reaction. A pre-existing physical or mental condition is exacerbated. Uh, the user is pregnant. Uh, the individual is arrested for use. Heredity or environment dictates addiction. Uh, previous addiction with the other substances leads to relapse. I told you that uh, I, I am related to uh, Presidents Adams and Adams, John Quincy and John. Uh, unfortunately, that side of my family uh, has a lot, there's a lot of addiction in that, that side of my family. Uh, but uh, we did not, uh, I, I have uh, five brothers and sisters, none of, the, none of us are drug users. And one of the reasons is because uh, despite the fact that John, and J John Adams and John Quincy Adams uh, were our relatives and they had, an addi they had addictive personalities, uh, they married into two Quaker, uh, Quaker families. And the Quaker families, of course, don't use, don't use alcohol, don't use any, any drugs or of any kind or at all. They don't even smoke cigarettes. They don't even smoke or chew. Uh, so that's what uh, kind of uh, uh, changed the heredity in my family is by, is by the addicted people marrying into the Quaker families. <laughs> and because of that, they lost their, their hereditary structure or whatever. Anyway, uh, social recreational use. Uh, social recreational users may seek out a drug for the effect, but no permanent pattern of use is developed. 
uh, usage can be controlled for these uh, individuals as long as they do not develop drug-seeking behavior. Habituation, uh, the individual has developed a pattern of usage, but there has been no negative effects on the individual's life thus far. Uh, this is referred to as, as habituation because though there is no increase of, of usage, the usage pattern indicates that there is a definite craving for the substance, and this is, of course, habituation. Uh, abuse, the individual continues to use the substance despite the negative life consequences uh, that have occurred. Uh, these consequences can be personal, uh, they can, maybe they lost a relationship, uh, problems in their social lives, uh, they went to the bar and now nobody wants to be around them because they're mean, uh, they're a mean drug. Uh, financial, they've lost uh, money because of, of their, the drugs. Most things cost a lot of money. Uh, one of the ways that we reduce the smoking in the United States is by raising the price of cigarettes. Uh, once upon a time, when I was young, they were like a quarter a pack, uh, and now, of course, they're like five or six dollars or something, whatever. Eight dollars for a package of cigarettes? That's well, it depends on the brand, but it's seven to eight bucks. Wow, that's, that's pretty good money. What is that, 40 cents a, a cigarette? Shoot, in New York, they're like almost like 10 bucks. Oh, gee. Legal continued use despite arrest for possession, medical, personal health, uh, alcoholic with diabetes. The how, can, how stupid can you be? Uh, one of my best friends in high school was a diabetic, and he wanted to be just like his brother, and his brother was an alcoholic. Uh, so he died at 39. He drank himself to death. Uh, it's really stupid for somebody who needs to shoot up with insulin to be a drinker. And that's what he would do. He had a formula that he used. He had to anticipate how much alcohol he was going to drink, and then he shot himself up with that much insulin in order to take care of the alcohol. This was, he had a formula, and, and it worked for an extended length of time. Uh, but eventually he uh, drank more beers than he thought he was supposed to, or that, that he anticipated. And uh, of course, he had to be cool. He had to be cool, so he had to drink. Uh, he'd had all of his teeth knocked out uh, in, a, in a fight. Damn, you think you'd be hanging out with me? <laughs> oh, well, he's just my friend in high school, in, uh, in grade school. He's one of my best friends. Uh, and, and I tried to talk him out of it. He's really smart. I mean, he had a higher IQ than mine, than my IQ. And he was just really brilliant, except he wanted to be cool. And of course, that, that's the last thing I am, is cool. So. I didn't have to worry about it. Anyway, <coughs> now all the diabetes. Heavy smoker with emphysema. Uh, you see these people carrying around their oxygen, and they'll take the cannulas out of their nose, and then they'll, they'll smoke their cigarette, and then they'll put the oxygen back in. That's stupid. That's just stupid. That's too I much. I saw a lady this weekend. She had one of those um, things. <laughs> and I saw her. She's like, I'm like, uh, yeah. If at that point, she talked about it. But it's. What's this for? I got mean, the addiction so bad. Yeah. It's over with. It's kind of freaky. She, it looks like she put a thing with like a USB, the memory stick, and yeah, she ordered food. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The co co cocaine user with uh, hypertension, of course, isn't going to last for very long. None of these individuals are going to live for very long. Uh, people that are smoking and, and have emphysema, of course. Uh, a year, six months, you know. A diabetic who's an alcoholic, eh, you know, six months, maybe a year, maybe 18 months. Cocaine user with hypertension, well, probably tomorrow. Work or school related, of course. Uh, you can't function in school. Emotional stability, uh, you, LSD user with mental, uh, mental instability. Uh, it's not gonna last for very long. Uh, it's kind of like committing suicide. Addiction, uh, the difference between abuse and addiction is the compulsive behavior of the addict. Addiction is a classification that the individual has no control over the duration of usage or the amount that they use. Uh, the individual has been unsuccessful at control. Uh, they speed, they spend an inordinate amount of time, time obtaining drugs or recovering from the usage. <coughs> I had a friend that started smoking pot in uh, Vietnam. Uh, came back, uh, came back from Vietnam. He was a uh, uh, 
uh, heavy, let's see, how, how did this work? He, he, he drove uh, heavy artillery. Uh, it, it was like an anti-tank gun, which was stupid because there were no, you know, the, the enemy had no tanks. But he, that, that's what he drove. So he, it, it never fought, he never fired this thing. I mean, it never fired. But that was his job. He was the driver of the, the half of Like a big AT-4? Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. He never used it. He never used it. They never used it. They never needed it. Uh, anyway, so he was over there for, thir it was a 13-month uh, combat tour. Uh, when he came back, uh, I guess he smoked a lot of pot over there. And when he came back, he wanted to continue smoking pot. Well, they owned, they owned like 400 acres of farmland. And slowly they lost all these fields, you know, 20 acres at a time. He would sell these things off so that he, would, he could uh, continue his, his usage. Eventually, of course, they didn't have a farm anymore, and he's still using. And today, I, he's still alive, and he's, he's in his 70s. He's my age. Uh, that's all he does is look for drugs. That's all he does every day. He gets up and looks for more, more pot. This is all he does? That's all he does. This is smoke good. Yeah. He's social security. He's on social security. He's, he's also got a, he's, he's disabled. He has a disability, which has nothing to do with his military uh, Ooh, service. If he's smart, they can actually give him the pills. The problem is he smoked, he's been smoking pot every day for, you know, almost 50 years. Smart is the last thing he is. That's the last thing he is. Oh, yeah. He doesn't recognize anybody. I, he's just as well as anyone. No, because they, they, um, they, they try to put me on it, but then I was taking something else, and they mm -hmm. said, well, it might the right, counteract it, so we shouldn't keep you on just this one. I was like, right, that's, I don't care. Okay. It's doing it better. Whatever. Most of the drugs that have to do with marijuana, <coughs> cannabinol and um, uh, marinol, uh, they're just maintenance drugs. Uh, they don't really... Some VAs just give you... Okay, straight up. Oh, well they give you pot. Well that's, yeah. that's just a maintenance drug. It's not going to make, it's not going to help you recover. Because you can, you know, you... I, I have a friend of mine, uh, he was, uh, he was a ranger too. Uh -huh. And he, uh, I think a month, he was allowed at an hour, right? But he only does it when it's like real freaking bad. Right. It's been almost like 12, almost a year. He still has the very first house that they gave him. He'll use it when it's like really super bad. Right, yeah. But see, <clears throat> people don't do that. If you give them, yeah, exactly. If you give them the drug, they start using it. Now all of a sudden, that's, you know, that's part of their, their lives. That's what's ha happened with my friend. You know, this is, he, he claimed he had PTSD. Well, he, he never saw any combat. He just but, doesn't like not having control of his mind. Well, I think that's, that's like a lot better of us going by the, the Ranger model. And yeah. He just doesn't, he doesn't like it. Well, he wasn't a Ranger. He, he drove a truck. <laughs> and that was about it. <laughs> Uh, okay, so what are we doing? The limit, uh, they limit uh, social, occupational, or recreational activities so that they can use. Uh, they continue use despite physical, social, relationship, or psychological problems. They use in the morning for a jump start on the day. Uh, they defend their drug usage with anger or even rage. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's this guy. I mean, he gets, that's one of the, he has no friends, you know, I, because he gets angry with them when they tell him, you know, I, you know, I could get you into a program, you know, that kind of stuff. He just, it just pisses him off. And of course, he's got no brains left. Uh, they experience withdrawal when unable to use the drug. Uh, they must increase the amount used uh, to obtain the desired effect. This is true of everything except marijuana. Uh, marijuana is accumulative in your system. Uh, so, uh, and then that's what's going on with him. He doesn't have to use as much as he used to uh, because he's, been smoking every day, a lot every day, uh, for an extended length of time, and now he just needs to smoke once a day and he's fine because it brings out the rest of the THC that's in his system. Uh, addiction comprises of four C's, 
uh, loss of control, uh, compulsive use of the drug, uh, craving the drug, and continued use of the drug. Those are the four C's of addiction. The American Psychiatric Association has identified substance use as a mental illness since the printing of their first diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders in 1952. The current DSM-5 provides substance, divides substance abuse disorders into two general categories, substance-related disorders and substance, substance addictive disorders. Okay, for the longest time we didn't think that cocaine and marijuana were addictive. And the reason is because cocaine gets uh, bleaches out of your system really, really fast. Uh, so we didn't think it was addictive. But people that use it on a regu relatively regular basis, they do become addicted to it. We didn't think marijuana was addictive because people didn't have withdrawal symptoms. The reason they didn't have withdrawal symptoms is because it stays in your system for a, an extended length of time, 28 days. Uh, stays in your system for about a month. <clears throat> So people were, the, uh, uh, it was, good, it was ble bleaching out of their system. They were getting it out of their system very, very slowly. And because of that, they had marijuana in their system. So they, they weren't having withdrawal symptoms. But now we know that that's not true. It is addictive. It's highly addictive. Uh, DSM-5 deals with several drugs, which include alcohol, stimulants, uh, marijuana, and cocaine. And of course, now we know, realize that they are addictive substances. Hallucinogens, uh, inhalants, opioids, anxiolytics, which are anti-anxiety drugs, uh, sedatives, hypnotics, uh, caffeine, and tobacco. And of course, we'll be talking about all of these substances this semester. Uh, the addictive disease model, uh, this model of addiction sees addiction from the medical point of view, that addiction is a disease. Uh, the reason it's a disease is because it's chronic, it's progressive, it's relapsing, it's incurable, and it's potentially fatal. Now the problem with this model is that they see it as incurable. In other words, once, you, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, you can never use alcohol again. And that's, that's a problem. Um, <clears throat> this is the addictive disease model is the model that uh, the Al Alcoholics Anonymous uses. They tell you it's a disease. It's not your fault. That you, you are an alcoholic, but it's not your fault. So they have the 12-step program. I don't know if you've ever dealt with this 12-step program or anybody around you. I had an ex-wife that was a, an alcoholic. And step five is apologizing to all the people that you hurt. So I got a telephone call from my ex-wife. And she apologized for leaving me. Uh, when I met her, she was an alcoholic, but I didn't know it. Uh, and she was using me to help her, her uh, get over her alcoholism. Um, and as long as she wasn't using, then everything was fine. She had a certain personality. As soon as uh, stress, and it, the stress didn't have anything to do with me, it didn't have to do with the kids, it had to do with uh, her work. And as soon as stress started at work, she, she started drinking, and once she started drinking, her personality changed completely. So she left, uh, and she called to apologize. <laughs> uh, and of course, I'm pretty damn stupid. I'll accept just about anything. <clears throat> anyway, so. Oh, you're the greatest love of my life. Thank you. I'm only one of seven husbands she's ever had. Uh, I was number three. I met her when she was 21. She'd already been married twice. Jeez. Huh? I know. She's a professional marrier. She's really good at it. Thank you. He's new to me. It was interesting. <coughs> this model assumes that the addiction is caused from genetic irregularities in brain chemistry and anatomy that are triggered by certain drugs. Research shows that heredity influences drug use and addiction as much as 40 to 60 percent. And we'll talk about that later in the chapter. The addictive disease model, uh, in this model, uh, compulsive drug use with prolonged intoxication with a need to continue use, uh, inability to control the use so it's not your fault. 
The addiction is not your fault. Inability to stop use uh, despite physical, mental, or social problems. Repeated attempts to control use. Increase intake over time. Uh, it's incurable, like I said before. Pathological reactions such as blackouts or dramatic personality changes. Uh, and that's the, the uh, addictive disease model, which is the medical model. Uh, and the uh, uh, operative word here is incurable. They don't think it's, it's, it's curable. The behavioral environmental model, uh, this theory purports that negative environmental factors such as abuse, anger, and peer pressure may cause people to seek, use, and sustain a dependence on substances. This model emphasizes the progressive nature of the six levels of drug use, abstinence, experimentation, social uh, recreational use, habituation, abuse, and addiction. The <coughs> academic model, the, the, this makes a lot of sense. The behavioral environmental model, this is what Scott was talking about before in his neighborhood. Uh, there were two methadone clinics. Uh, the environment was relatively negative. There were individuals uh, that had grown up in, in uh, Family situations that were not very positive because of that, of course, they saw this as a way out. Uh, and it was, it was a negative environment. And since the, the environment was so negative, there was a lot of drug use, uh, alcohol and drug use in, in the community. The academic model, addiction occurs when the body adapts to to the toxic effects of drugs at the biochemical and cellular levels. Uh, natural balance has been thrown off, causing four uh, physiological changes. Uh, they develop a tolerance, uh, they develop tissue dependence. Uh, of course, that creates the withdrawal syndrome if they ever try to stop. And of course, they have psychological dependence at the same time. The diathesis stress model, this model first developed to, was first developed to explain the causes of schizophrenia. It is a combination of addictive disease model and the behavior environmental model. Uh, diathesis means a predisposition or, or vulnerability to, and in this case, the individual may have a genetic and environmental predisposition to drug addiction, like my family has, like the Adams family has. Uh, stress triggers the drug need and the stronger <coughs> the diathesis, the more likely the individual will drift into addiction. Uh, so what you have to do is stay away from that potential addiction. Uh, heredity, researchers have found that genetics does influence addiction, but that there are over 100 genes that have something to do with drug abuse. Uh, if we could uh, just change those, those genes, then we could keep people from being uh, drug abusers. Uh, some of these uh, genes have to do with receptor sites, the, the number of receptor sites, uh, gene transcription factors, enzymes, neuropeptides, G-proteins, transporters, all of this has to do with addiction. So if we cure, if we take care of one of these factors, then a lot of times it doesn't make a difference uh, as far as the individual being in it, an addict. Uh, looking at twin studies, Goodwin found that of identical twins separated at birth, they were most likely to choose the addiction or the abstinence patterns of their biological parents over, the, over their adoptive parents. Uh, similar research found that 61% of the sample maintained nicotine dependence, uh, similar to their biological parents, and 55% displayed the same alcohol dependence as their biological parents. Researchers looking at males in treatment found that children with one alcoholic parent had a 34% greater probability of being an alcoholic than the male children of, of a non-alcoholic. John Adams was not an alcoholic. Uh, he had three male children, and of those three male children, two, two of them turned out to be alcoholics. His son, the one that wasn't an alcoholic, was John Quincy Adams, who also became president of the United States. <clears throat> John Quincy Adams had three sons, and of those three sons, two of them became alcoholics and died young, and the other one didn't. And of course, he, he became relatively famous. Uh, actually, he became fairly successful. Uh, so he, uh, John Adams wasn't an alcoholic, but his sons were. John Quincy Adams wasn't an alcoholic, but his brothers were. And of course, two of his sons became alcoholics. 
Uh, when both parents are alcoholics, the child has a 400% probability of being an alcoholic, which is kind of interesting. I had a colleague uh, when I was teaching at Mississippi University for Women, uh, and both of his parents were alcoholics. He was, he was Air Force. <laughs> and so was his dad. <laughs> Uh, so his mom and his dad were alcoholics, and but when I met him, he was in his 50s, and he was an alcoholic. And he had two daughters and a son, and both of his daughters were alcoholics, which was kind of curious. Anyway, it was really kind of interesting. He uh, retired from the Air Force as a major, as an 05. 04. He was an 04. Uh, yeah, 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 he was an 04. Which, that's really not very high. He had also been a Navy SEAL. He was one of the first Navy SEALs. Did he go and enlisted? He went in and enlisted. Uh, as a, he was a Navy SEAL. UDT, it was uh, underwater d demolition. Uh, that's that's, that's pretty decent. Kind of like in the Army Green and Gold. Yeah. That's, that's Pretty decent, man. Yeah. Then he joined the, <coughs> he was uh, still enlisted in the Navy. When he got out, he couldn't figure out what to do. So he joined the Air Force, he got his degree, joined the Air Force, and became a fighter pilot. And he uh, flew in Vietnam, F-4s in Vietnam. Uh, then they changed the airframes, you know, from F-4s to F-15s and F-16s. Uh, F-15s and F-16s have a smaller, uh, cockpit, and he was like six foot five. <laughs> oh man! Yeah, so he was too tall for the the uh, the new fighter planes, the F-15s and F-16s, because his head stuck up above the uh, the back of the seat. So if he ever had to punch out, he was going to punch out with his head instead of the seat. Normally, when they punch out, the seat punches a hole in the canopy, and then you know and the everything's fine. But he was too tall. And so he couldn't fly the, the F-15s and F-16s, as weird as it is. Why am I talking about this? Oh, 400% probability of being an alcoholic. And he was an alcoholic. Uh, if both parents and a grandfather are alcoholics, the individual had a, has a 900% greater probability of being an alcoholic. What if one parent is a, one like my dad, my real dad, and his dad? And his dad? Uh, wait a minute, both parents, okay, uh, that's right here, 34% probability of being an alcoholic. 34%. Well, oh, I, I quit drinking I know, I know you yeah. have, I know you yeah. <coughs> There for a while. <coughs> yeah. yeah. 28 million Americans have one parent who is an alcoholic. 28 million Americans out of 360,000, uh, or 360 million. Uh, heredity, uh, researchers have found that 70% of severe alcoholics have a dopamine controlling gene called DRD2A1. This is really important. DRD2A1. This gets really weird. If you've got this gene, then all kinds of crazy things happen to you. Among social drinkers, only 30% have this gene. They can control their drinking. 30%. When the gene is present, the individual has fewer dopamine receptor sites in the nucleus accumbens. Since many of the missing sites are D2 sites, the individual will need more intense stimulation to feel satisfaction. So it's harder for them to be happy because they have fewer D2 receptor sites in their nucleus accumbens. This is the DRD2A1. It gets really interesting after this. DR2A1 gene seems to indicate the tendency for any problem behavior as it has been found in other addictive behaviors other than alcoholism, uh, gambling. Uh, these individuals are more likely to have ADHD. They're more likely to have aberrant sexual behavior. And if you've looked at any pornography sites to see what type of pornography is out there, there's some really screwed up pornography. We're not just talking about sexual stimulation. We're talking about abusive sexual stimulation. We're talking about a lot of really strange things out there. Who are these people that need this type of, of sexual stimulation? Well, it's the people of DRD2A1 receptor sites or, or genes. 
these are these individuals are more likely to overeat. Uh, they're more likely to have antisocial personality disorder. They're more likely to have Tourette's syndrome. Some refer to this gene as the compulsivity gene and the process as the reward deficiency syndrome. They can't <coughs> feel satisfaction. They need excessive stimulation. This is what happen when, happens when people use cocaine. If they've used cocaine as an aphrodisiac, which works in the beginning, if they become addicted to cocaine, they build up a tolerance to it. Now all of a sudden, whereas before it led to normal uh, sexual uh, stimulation, and all of, a, all of a sudden they need violent uh, sexual stimulation. And it's usually violence on the individual that they're having sex with. So they become uh, sadistic. As weird as that is. And this is the gene, the DRD2A1. They need excessive stimulation in order to, be, uh, to, to find any satisfaction. People with DRD2A1 uh, need, uh, tend to consume large quantities of psychoactive substances before becoming intoxicated and then have a greater dysfunction when they do get drunk, such as blackouts and brownouts. So this is a really interesting uh, situation, uh, individuals with this gene. Uh, they also have wanderlust. They don't like to stay in one place. Weird, weird stuff taking place. Uh, these are the individuals that uh, never leave the casino. <clears throat> Isn't that freaky? <laughs> yeah, me and my wife went to one and there was this lady who said, I've been here for three days, blah, blah, blah. I'll give yeah. you money if you give me a ride to freaking someone in Colorado. I'm like, no. Who <laughs> does that kind of stuff? There are also genes that make it less likely that a person will develop an addiction. DRD4 uh, gives the individual an excess of dopamine, which has been shown to play a role in spiritual acceptance, making it less likely that the individual will accept the addictive lifestyle. These individuals with the DRD4, they have lots of, of uh, they're, they're happy all the time. Everything makes them happy, DRD4. But if they're DRD2A1, they have fewer receptor sites so nothing makes them happy. They need excessive stimulation in order to be happy. These individuals, you know, they're always happy. I think I must have DRD4 because every, I, you know, nothing bothers me. I don't seem to need excessive stimulation in order to be happy. But uh, the people with DRD2A1, they need to gamble, and if they gamble, they need to feel that stimulation. They need to. to continue to win or, or continue to do something in order to get that stimulation. The DRD4, they're happy all the time. In, uh, the environment, interactions with the environment, uh, but especially the home environment, make new nerve cell connections and alter the neurochemistry that the individual was born uh, with. Determining if and how the individual will use psychoactive drugs. Factors in the environment, uh, physical, sexual, emotional abuse as a child, the, the amount of stress in the family, the amount of love shown in the, in the, uh, in the family, uh, whether they grew up in poverty, whether they had things or whether they didn't have things. Their living conditions, was it dirty, was it small, uh, were they, was it overcrowded? Uh, the relationships with your brothers and sisters and your parents. Uh, nutritional balance, did you get the right foods? Were you getting the right vitamins? And of course, now we take care of this in school because we have uh, school lunches that theoretically have uh, all the nutrients that, they, that people need. Of course, this current administration is thinking of cutting that. Uh, they, did, they cut it during the uh, Reagan administration. There were regulations, and during the Reagan administration, they decided that uh, vegetables were too expensive, they spoiled too easily, uh, so they decided to uh, make ketchup, ketchup, those little packages of ketchup, as a vegetable. So all they needed to do was put pa packages of ketchup for your french fries or, pa or ketchup for your hamburger, whatever. That was your vegetable. So they didn't have to feed you vegetables. No green beans anymore. No peas. No corn. <coughs> we'll just throw stuff. 
Ah, nutritional balance, healthcare, neighborhood safety, of course, school quality, peer pressure, the internet, television, all of these things have to do with, with uh, how your brain develops. Uh, the environment molds the brain's architecture and neurochemistry, determining how the individual will react to outside influences. This is especially true in the first 10 years of life. We're not talking about us being grown-up people and being able to handle just about anything uh, to the extent that uh, Scott's been uh, deployed eight times. Six. Six times. I count it as eight. No, it was eight. <laughs> I, like 20, but... <laughs> I know. One was split in half. Or two of them were split in half. Uh, <clears throat> So we're not really talking about us as adults. We're talking about when we were kids. <coughs> and of course, half of this stuff you can't remember because how do you remember what was going on when you were five years old? Probably not a whole lot. Or when you were in the first grade. You probably remember your first grade teacher, maybe some of your friends, but you don't, you don't remember what happened on November 3rd of whatever your first grade year, or you do. November 3rd? It was your birthday? I don't even remember high school. You don't even remember high school. Okay. <laughs> the brain develops from the front uh, to the back, meaning that adolescents are more prone to uh, poor impulse control behaviors like substance abuse. This is a really serious problem. Teenagers are followers. They're like a bunch of, of lemmings. They just follow each other. If somebody wears uh, a sweater to school and there everybody thinks they're cool and all of a sudden everybody wears sweaters. If one guy's got Air Jordans on, everybody has to wear Air Jordans. Uh, as strange as that is. The hairstyle. Everybody has to have the same hairstyle. Everybody has to listen to the same damn music. She's just trying to fit in. Everybody wants to fit in exactly. I did that. You didn't fit in? You're fitless? No, I joined the new You're in a game. game. You were in a game. What are we talking about? You had to fit in. Recent research shows that it takes at least 20 years for the brain to become hardwired, and the prefrontal uh, lobe continues to grow until around the 44th year. This is one of the reasons why it's really important if you can stay away from all these addictive substances until you're 21, until you've got a brain of your own instead of you've got uh, a brain just like all your peers then you're less likely to become addicted. I was lucky. When I was in school, I wasn't a follower, and the reason I wasn't a follower was because I wasn't religious. And religion was really important in my, in my, uh, where I grew up. And because of that, I was already rejected. I didn't have to worry about it. I have brothers and sisters. They didn't go to church either, but they, were, they hid it. They hid the fact that they didn't go to church. And because of that, they became followers. And bad things happened to them. Memories are established through a network of neurons involving select neurotransmitters, norepinephrine, serotonin, acetylcholine, and dopamine. The more an action is repeated, the more likely the individual will remember it, unless the memory is emotionally intense, in which case the memory has a stronger memory network. Uh, hence the intrusive uh, memories of a traumatic event that may end up uh, causing post-traumatic stress disorder. And of course, uh, it just takes one time. You don't have to be shot at three times to remember, oh, bullets. I remember that. I, rem I remember what it sounds like when somebody <coughs> shoots at you. <coughs> I remember what an explosion sounds like. Actually, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's a, more of a concussion. You feel the concussion. Why are we talking about this? We're talking about things that you remember. Otherwise, if you do something three times, you remember it. If you read something three times, the same thing three times, you will remember it.